Uh, Vanakam, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Logi, for that generous welcome. Dr. Sampat, delegates from all parts of the world and delegates from other parts of South Africa, uh, Vanakam to everyone. <clears throat> Vasudeva Kutumbakam. Is that correct? Vasudeva Kutumbakam is a powerful message. It means the world is one family. In Zulu, the same sentiment is expressed in Ubuntu. I am because of you. And really, it's an expression of one of our basic principles as we build our new post-apartheid society of unity in diversity. And of course, India is a powerful example of that. Uh, its history in managing its diversity to the point where today it is arguably one of the top three giants on the international stage. Of course, it's appropriate at this time that both our countries revere both the Mahatma and Nelson Mandela for what they stand for as far as the, those basic values are concerned. <clears throat> Of course, I'm very happy to be here because it talks to my own identity, a very deep thing. I was brought up by my grandmother, and they decided to name me Ravi Gerson Ranganad and Pile. Hmm? And I have to explain that to many people. Um, one of my Muslim friends would say, no, that's a language on its own. Just... <laughs> my grandmother insisted that I go to Tamil school in the afternoon when I was very young. So I learned, I learned a bit about my Ana Abidas and Khan Anganas. And I learned a bit about the Tevarum because we had to sing at service. I subsequently lost much of that, although I try to retain some links when I go for various religious functions. But I'm raising it because it's a part of my identity in a very deep way. Um, and when we have debates about identity in South Africa, and you can imagine we have many debates about identity and ethnicity in South Africa, um, I say I refuse to be inferior to anyone. Steve Biko taught me that. I claim no superiority. My religion teaches me that. But I will claim my space. And we try to urge every South African to claim their space within the context of the society we're trying to build. Now, I'm, I believe we have very limited time. Uh, I've been put into this slot, but I'm not really under agriculture. That's not my line function department. Uh, so I will speak in the main on housing, but just a few comments on agriculture. I think it represents something like 267 billion rand of our annual GDP. In KZN, of course, the historic agricultural activities around sugarcane and there are many, many sugar mills and processing, and I understand that you have some of your own leading figures in that industry present, and I'm sure that you will do the comparisons and see what efficiencies and uh, synergies that could be obtained by a closer cooperation. There's a strong timber production with the processing as well, with a factory, a company called SAPI, a major uh, chemical producing uh, business entity. Dairy farming is, is quite strong. Uh, I think in our in hinterland and the Midlands, we estimate that we produce about 30% of the milk that's produced in South Africa, which will be more small in South Africa in, 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 in relation to, to the kind of production you have in India, uh, but nevertheless significant for our province. And I think we can learn a lot from India because I've been privy to some presentations and they talk about how not too long ago you were in, probably a milk importer and now by massifying your milk production in the way you have, you're a milk exporter. And uh, the stories we hear about how you've drilled down to the village and uh, every, every household that has a dairy cow is in a position to take its product of milk to a local uh, market and be assured of it being purchased at a reasonable price is the kind of models we desperately need. 
uh, because we want to have what we call this broad-based economic empowerment. Our inequality levels are still too high and not sustainable. So we think we can learn a lot from you. Of course, there's maize and fruit uh, production, which are very strong, just like you. There's still a debate about ethanol. Uh, ethanol, of course, is a, a, a pretty easy byproduct of, of sugar. Uh, but there's still a debate about what the regulatory framework should be with regard to ethanol being part of the fuel mix. Um, so that's not quite concluded yet, but if it is, you can imagine the kind of uh, uh, exponential increase that would give to, to the production in the sugar industry. This morning you had the MEC for Economic Development, and he might have mentioned something called RASET. RACET is an uh, acronym for Radical Agrarian Socioeconomic Transformation. Because if you look at the inequality we have and the millions that are there in the rural areas in particular, and we need to bring them into the economic mainstream, then we have to have radical programs, but things that work. And you have gone through it, and in, uh, India in particular has gone through it. And we need to see how where you were 30 years ago and where you are now, and what you did, and we don't have to repeat your mistakes, you can tell us what are the successful models to be, uh, to be implemented. So I, I, I think there's a huge opportunity in agriculture. I'm not the expert in it, uh, but I thought I'll just mention those points because I think there's fertile ground for investment in that particular sector. As I was introduced, I am the MEC for human settlements, we call it, or housing in popular language. And I'll take you to a quick presentation uh, on what is the work that I do. I'm really going to fly through it because I don't believe I have enough time to, to really deal with it in detail. But the first few slides will just give you some statistics on what we are about. That's KwaZulu-Natal. Uh, it's made up of various districts. Those are the population numbers uh, and the various districts that we have. I'm not sure how many countries in the world have a constitutional mandate with regard to housing, uh, but we do. It's set out in our constitution. Uh, we have policy instruments, we have a national development plan, and we have what is called a provincial master spatial plan. I thought it important just to quote from section 26 of the constitution. It actually says everyone has a right to have access to adequate housing. The state must take reasonable legislative and other measures within its available resources to achieve the progressive realization of this right, and nobody may be evicted from a home without a court order. So that puts a constitutional obligation on government. You can't say there's no money for housing. You have to say, okay, within its available resources, but we have to have a plan. And just to give you an indication of where we are, we roughly at this point in time are spending something like 30 billion rand nationally. 30 billion rand on housing. If we take in the province, I myself as, a, as MEC control a budget of about 3.5 billion rand, and then the cities uh, about another 3 billion rand for their bulk infrastructure. So that's about a total of 6 billion rand being invested directly uh, per, per annum. Uh, we are in fact proud as KZN, we have been the best performing provinces, province for four years running now uh, which we received as recently as, as last week. Uh, the legislative framework, I'm not going to go through that. I'm not going to go through the theory of policy framework. I'm going to try to take you through what are the various instruments. In other words, we have various programs around housing and, what, and where do you, you might be able to see uh, your skills or investment opportunities that you think are worthwhile. We have a BNG program which is the First picture on Konubia Ramesh. Um, we just try to display the kind of environments we want to build, uh, not just a house, but a human settlement. Uh, we say we want to build spaces where people live, play, work, and even pray, you know, in, in a close environment. Uh, that's Konubia. You'll see more pictures of that just now. We do have a master, a human settlements master spatial plan that talks to the theory of housing. We don't have time to go through that. Just to give you an indication of what we have delivered thus far, we're delivering about 17% of the national product. Um, and in fact, we are 
as you can see there, we've uh, nationally, uh, we've done about, sorry, provincially we've done about 600,000 houses thus far since, de since democracy uh, uh, arrived. The next one gives you the backlogs, and this tells you the opportunity. These are the backlogs we have. Uh, if we continue at the same pace, it will take us 30 to 40 years to clear the backlog. Of course, it's in the context of urbanization, but I place those figures before you to show that there's a continuous op opportunity. Now, as business people, you'll be interested in the subsidy quantum, and these are figures which I'm not going to go through the details. Those who are interested can ask for it. Uh, but this tells you the breakdown that we spend a basic cost of about 110,000 rand for houses. And these are free houses, by the way. Uh, we give these houses free to, uh, to people who qualify. And the basic qualification criteria is you must be earning less than 3,500 rand per month, or the household income must be less than 3,500 uh, rand per month. Of course, this 110 is a basic figure. We have various variation allowances uh, for various technical factors, and that figure goes up to closer to 160,000 rand uh, per annum. Of course, migration trends and patterns, I just thought it meant appropriate to mention this. I'm sure India has its own urbanization uh, challenges. We too, too. We estimate that by the year 2030, we'll have another seven to eight million more people in our cities, which will be small numbers in relation to your 1.3 billion population, but still very big for us. Uh, that means in a city like Teguini, where we are, which is currently having a population of about 3.5 million by 2030, we'll have another one more million people coming to the town from the rural areas and other parts, even other parts of Africa. We have to have a plan to house those people. And that's where we think the opportunity will lie for creative solutions to the housing problems. Like you, uh, I mean, all of us remember, what is it called, the, the major blockbuster movie, um, India? Slumdog Millionaire. Right? Everybody remembers Slumdog Millionaire. And I mean, that gave a portrayal of the kind of informal settlements you have in India. We have our share of informal settlements. The numbers are on the slide there. And uh, it's a challenge for us. We estimate that actually close to 30% of the population of Durban or Itegwini are now in informal settlements. That's a function of the urbanization that I spoke about. Um, but again, you've made huge strides in dealing with your informal settlements or slums. Uh, you've got models uh, which you've come up with which we think are very interesting, and I'll touch on that as the last point in my, in my presentation. We do have a major rural housing program. Uh, just in, we're building about 10,000 units of rural housing a year. Uh, it's going very well. It is a priority program. The next slide will show you a picture, or the next two slides will show you pictures of the kind of houses uh, we are building. The, that one tells you the kind of structure they moved from, uh, and then the one in the foreground is the type of houses that we are, we, we are, we are, um, we are, we are building in our rural areas. But I must hasten to add, in as much as this is a very, very successful program, our national planning, uh, national development plan uh, commands us to shift resources to our urban areas. And that's because of the urbanization that's taking place uh, and the kind of densification models that we need to look to uh, and the urban centers of, being, of course, being the centers of economic growth. And that's where the jobs are. That's why people are moving there. So the rural area will, at one stage, was enjoying up to 60% of our budget. But we'll have to actually reverse that ratio over the next five to 10 to 10 years. Uh, the next slide just give, tell, give you some figures. And the next one gives you an example of one of our flagship projects called Conubia, which is here in, 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 in Itegwini. Ultimately, this will be made up of uh, 15,000 units of this type, which means free housing. Uh, but another 15,000 is where the, is in the gap market or the middle income market. That's not free. And I would suggest to those who are interested in housing and have the skills from the technical and financing side that this is where there's a real investment opportunity as far as the gap market is concerned or the middle income um, uh, is concerned. Uh, we, I think we have the te technical capacity, but because of where we find ourselves in the economic environment, 
I think on the financial side uh, is where the opportunity might also lie. So those who can combine a financial formula together with a technical capacity would have huge prospects of delivering a very decent return uh, in, a, in a very credible way uh, and, and at the same time satisfy a, a great social need. Social housing is another word for rental housing. Again, here there's a huge opportunity. Uh, this is for people earning 7,500 rand and below, and the government gives an assistance. And, and to oversimplify it, uh, government gives an assistance of about 100,000 rand a unit, which works out to about 25% of the total cost. In fact, you get another grant from the national department, which takes it up to about 40% which means you have to borrow about 60%, but in return, you, the rentals are subsidized. But it's a financial model which is working. There are many social housing institutions that are operating and, and making a decent uh, profit, but it is a social housing program. And the next picture gives you a picture of the kind of uh, units that we are building. Uh, this is the Westgate Grange. It's, uh, you'll see other pictures later on. It's one of the biggest social housing programs in, 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 in the country. Then we have what is called CRUs, which is community residential units. Uh, as a legacy from apartheid times, we had a whole range of hostels where migrant workers would stay in overcrowded conditions in hostels. And uh, it's a quite a complex environment, but we are converting these hostels into community residential units to make it more decent. And this is a place called Glieblands, which those of you who follow the news very carefully would know that it's famous for other reasons as well. But there's over 20,000 people just staying in one block of hostels. That tells you the level of densification that there is there. The next picture just gives you a, a, a more aerial picture of a pro project we spoke about earlier, the Ellos uh, West Grange in Peter Marisburg. This is the biggest social housing project in the country, uh, but it's be very proud of it as well. Uh, we then have informal settlement upgrades. Again, we think we can learn a lot from you because if we can't build houses for people, how can we still make their lives better through water, sanitation, roads, um, pathways, lighting, and so on. And we think you have models. We have budgets allocated for that in order to make their, their lives better. There's technologies that we think we can use. I mean, this is an example of a uh, Blushin facility, the blue steel structure there, which is a communal, communal toilet and bath bathing facility. Uh, high, very high ratio of usage, uh, but we're looking for cheaper and more durable products to serve large numbers of people. The next one is just a picture of the eradication of slums, the kind of buildings we, uh, do, to, we do to take out people from slums and, and put them directly in. The gap market is something I've mentioned. Uh, I, I think, again, I repeat that this is a, a key area where we think there's investment. Uh, we give a subsidy to the uh, beneficiary uh, for people. At the moment, the policy is those earning 15,000 rand or less. But I'm just coming from a meeting in Johannesburg yesterday where it's, uh, the decision is 99% taken to increase that threshold to 20,000 rand, the income ban to 20,000 rand, those earning 20,000 rand and less. Of course, they will have to get money from a bank, a finance, but we will give a subsidy of about 8 to 10 percent, uh, non, non repayable subsidy to that category of people. So if we can combine that with your financial skill, technical skill, and your beneficiary selection skill, we think there's an enormous opportunity for the Ridgeview Gardens. Is the next photograph is an example of a project that we've implemented on, on, on that basis. Uh, the next slide takes you through a whole range of catalytic projects. These are big mega projects which we're implementing in the Teguene area. And this gives you this multi, it's a multi-year program, of course, but gives you the number of units in the first column, uh, 5.7 billion Conubia phase one and two, 5.3 billion Conubia north, and so on. Gives you this, a, a sense of the scale of the projects uh, on, on that particular scale. In conclusion, I think we'd be very interested in your densification models. In other words, if there's little land, because you understand that a place like Durban, under its apartheid design, was planned for 20% of the people. After 1990 and 1994, 
it has to cater for 100 percent of the people and you got urbanization so the shortage of land is quite a critical one it's at least within proximities of the city center so we have to look at high density models for the poor high density models for the poor so the products that you have understand you had some pretty interesting experiments in india I'm not sure they will work here. I've heard of one model where there's cross-subsidization between the middle class and the poor. You can go up to 20 stories and have a, a workable model on that score. We would be interested to learn from that. We don't think the cross-subsidization model will work here. But from a technical point of view, what is the product that can be delivered at the lowest price uh, within our context? I think there's a huge opportunity there for creative business people. I'm sorry, it's a highly technical explanation, the uh, uh, speech that I had to give you, but that's the nature of my work. Of course, it's very much people-oriented as well, because you've got to take people along with you as you're planning to implement those projects. But we have been doing reasonably well in KZN. We're quite proud of that. But there are huge backlogs and a long way to go. We'd be very interested in having powerful partnerships with anybody from anywhere in the world. Thank you for listening to me. May God bless each and every one of you.